when you think of the United Nations, actually begins with we the peoples of the United Nations. Now since then, the nation has seemed to flip somewhat, we the peoples. But if you see what's happening in the world today, we the peoples seem to be coming back to claim their seat at the table. And this dialogue very much is a search to see should they be at the table? What seat should they occupy? How should they be prepared? How do things have to change? I want to introduce quickly the people who are on this podium with me, because they all have absolutely outstanding uh, predictions. And it, this is totally an alphabetical. Dr. Suhail Bashrui directs the Kahil Shibran Chair for Values and Peace here at the Center for Heritage Resource Studies at the University of Maryland. It is the first international academic forum devoted to the for preservation of Kahil Shibran's legacy the promotion of East-West intercultural relations. Professor Bashiri was the founding holder of the Baha'i Chair of the World East at the University of Maryland from 1993 to 2005. He is a senior scholar at the Center for International Development and Conflict Management, a senior scholar of the Academic Academy of Leadership both here at the university. A as a, uh, he has been a recipient of numerous awards which we would finish the night if I started listing them. But uh, we, among them is an honorary degree of a Doctor of Human Letters from Franklin and Marshall College, and a Julian Holster Award given by the Temple of Understanding, which is a famous interfaith organization in New York. So, Dr. Bashu, thank you very much for joining us, uh, as well as for giving us a legacy that is actually allowing this event to occur. Mr. Charles Doliak is a New Hampshire Supreme Court moderator, a senior partner in Ports, New Hampshire law firm, and Barton, Wardron, Doliak, Woodman, and Scott. I don't know who the partners are, but they have their names right. He is also the ethics faculty member of the Center for International Law in Dallas, Texas. He was president of the Japan American Society of New Hampshire and recipient of the Japanese Foreign Ministry of Law. Standing contributions to international understanding. He is, the new, he is the New Hampshire Humanity Council lecturer on the Cost of Peace Treaty and is chair of the Cost of Peace Treaty Anniversary Committee, who presided over the 100th anniversary celebration of that treaty. And we will hear more about it because, in many cases, the ethics of he and his associates were very much the inspiration between the theme of this event. Dr. Bonnie Foster is president of the Phelps Stoke Fund, America's oldest continuing operating foundation serving the needs of African American, Native American, African, and the rural and urban poor. He's held leadership positions at Princeton, Harvard, Tufts, Rutgers, Massachusetts, and Boston University. He is experienced as an educator and innovator in both the corporate world and in state and federal government. He served as director of the Lincoln Filing Center for Citizenship and Public Affairs at Tufts University. His most, in, immediate, uh, his most recent interest among many is the establishment of what is called Ralph Bunch Society National Initiative, which seeks to support undergraduates by addressing the need for greater minority involvement in the international arena, better preparation for minority students to become full and active participation, participants the global community and expansion of international academic and career opportunities for all students. So thank you, Dr. Foster. Dr. Joseph Montville is director of the Beyond Fundamentals <coughs> Project, sponsored by the Esalon Center for Theory and Research <coughs> and Institute for Citizen Diplomacy. He is also director of Toward the Abrionic Family Reunion a program to promote Muslim Christian Jewish reconciliation. He chairs the board of Track 2, the senior advisor on interfaith relations at the Center for Global Justice and Reconciliation in Washington Cathedral, and is distinguished diplomat in residence at American University. He has spent 23 years as a diplomat in the past with posts in the Middle East and North Africa, and worked at the State Department's Bureau of Near East and Southern Asian Affairs. Thank you very much.
The last person I'd like to introduce, and to whom I have to extend an extra thank you, because I know she made extremely heroic efforts to be here under an extremely tight schedule in difficult circumstances, is Linda Thomas Greenfield, a career member of the Senior Foreign Service. She was appointed Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau for Africa Affairs in December 2006. She also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary covering West Africa and Economic Affairs from January 2006 to December in the African Bureau. Previously, she was Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. She joined the Foreign Service in 1982 and served Hosts including Jamaica, Nigeria, Gambia, Kenya, the U.S. Mission in Geneva, Switzerland, as well as many other positions. Her domestic assignments were in the Bureau of Population, Refugee, and Immigration. She is the 2000 year recipient of the Warren Christopher Award for Outstanding Achievements in Global Affairs. Thank you very, very much, Secretary uh, Let me begin. So let's get down to the business. And let me begin by, we, we, we're going to have a dialogue on, on the need for, and that's a question, not a, uh, but the need for and the possibilities for and the ways of bringing people more together with formal institutions and policy methods. But I don't want to set up a straw man and say So I think the first thing we need is sort of a reality check about where are the policy in terms of past practices and in terms of the very problem of thinking afresh where people fit in the world of policy. I was wondering, Secretary, if you could begin the dialogue by giving us a little bit of light on where we are now. Good. Uh, thank you very much. I didn't expect to, to be called up uh, first. And, uh, let me just start by thanking you for this opportunity to uh, speak before this. Uh, tremendous uh, group of people who are interested, I hope, in diplomacy. I always use these opportunities as a recruitment opportunity, and you're never too old to join the Foreign Service. So if you are interested, uh, please let me know before, before I leave the room. Uh, you know, the State Department really has never, uh, it's never been about just communicating with government. But, with governments, which is what people see diplomacy as. It's a, it's a relationship, uh, a bilateral relationship, or multilateral, we're talking about the UN, between governments and multilateral organizations. That is not the way we see diplomacy. That's one part of it, it's part of, uh, but it's a part of a broad range of activities that we are involved in. But most importantly, uh, Secretary of State uh, Rice really defined what she sees as the new diplomacy. And she picked up on some of those things that we've always done, that we've not been very good at projecting to people. And that is her vision about partnership at all levels. And that we would work not just with diplomats, but we will work people to people. And that we will project U.S. power, U.S. interests, U.S. humanitarian concern, not just to governments, but directly to the people that we are dealing with. And I like the way you started when you talked about we the people, because that is what diplomacy is about. It's about how you deal with other, with other people. I really take a lot of pride that in the Africa Bureau, we have always done that. And there have been a couple of few studies that have been done lately that indicate that African people feel more positively about the United States than any other people anywhere in the world. And that African people have expressed the view that our foreign policy for the first time touches their, their lives. That policies such as the PEPFAR program, which is a program that assists people with HIV AIDS, that programs such as the malaria program, uh, several presidential initiatives that direct programs directly to young women who want to be educated, that people are beginning to see the impact of these programs. So they're not hearing about billion dollar aid programs that go to gov uh, that will go directly to government, but the 